welcome back to Lost Explained. In this sixth and final part of the Theory of Everything, we are going to tie up some of the loose ends from the series, including what might have happened after the Ajira plane took off in the end, exploring common misconceptions about the show and why they exist, discussing potential ideas of a lost sequel or reboot, and whether or not there should ever even be one, and opening up the magic box itself to see what lies within. Be sure to check out the previous five videos in this series as they address the major questions from the show and provide a context to the mythology. If you have a question about the show, I'm sure one of these parts will address it. Lost was a game-changing series that sucked in audiences from all around the world. We were dazzled by its creative invention, intrigued by its many mysteries, and enthralled by its character drama. The show has gone on to carve out an iconic place within pop culture and continues to stoke conversation and debate. There is no denying that it became a somewhat divisive show in certain circles as it went into its final season run. Now part of that division was caused by the way in which the story tackled answering its mysteries, and the fact that the writers continued to deploy various metaphors, abstractions and ambiguities within those revelations. As a result of this, a lot of room was left open for various interpretations. Co-creator and showrunner Damon Lindelof has discussed how much he disliked the explanation that George Lucas gave the Star Wars fandom in his prequel film The Phantom Menace. There's a scene in which the supernatural mystique of the Force is revealed as being not so much this unknowable, magical energy that links everything in the universe together, but in fact small microscopic life forms called midi-chlorians, and these midi-chlorians can be controlled and manipulated. It's perhaps an understatement to say that Star Wars fans had problems with this scene and this explanation. These kinds of information download scenes always tend to be divisive. There is nothing more inelegant in storytelling than long scenes of exposition and characters explaining the plot to one another for our benefit. Lindelof has made it clear in interviews that he certainly didn't need to know what the Force was. In fact, the midi-chlorians explanation in The Phantom Menace might well have been the scene that informed how he approached his own storytelling going forward. Did you see anything? Get any kind of look at it? No. Lost wanted to explain itself to us in a way that would keep some of the mystery alive long after the series finale had aired. They wanted us to keep talking about the show, to keep the mythology alive. If we had gotten Lost's version of the midi-chlorian scene about the light beneath the island, would it have really made the show more complete and satisfying, or would it have proven just as divisive? I think the power of Lost lies in its ability to include us within its storytelling, to get us to participate in the creation of its meaning, and to stimulate our own imaginations to connect the dots. Lost is, in part, about perception, both the singular perceptions of our characters and the perceptions of the audience watching the story being told. So, there is no better place to begin this final part in the Theory of Everything series than by exploring one of the more abstract mysteries of Lost, a mystery that actually helps us understand the narrative in more ways than one. It's time to open up the magic box. Picture a box. You know something about boxes, don't you, John? What if I told you that somewhere on this island, there's a very large box, and whatever you imagined, whatever you wanted to be in it, when you opened that box, there it would be. What would you say about that, John? The first time we hear the mention of the magic box is in Season 3 episode, The Man from Tallahassee. Benjamin Linus vaguely describes it to a sceptical John Locke as being a box that can manifest certain things into reality. It's a form of mind over matter. The literal implication of his statement is that a person could theoretically manifest their innermost desires and wants simply by thinking of it and willing it into existence. But this box could also mean that your subconscious might unintentionally manifest your fears and your weaknesses too. If this idea sounds familiar, it's because it might possibly be inspired from Michael Crichton's novel, Sphere, which saw a team of scientists discover a giant sphere beneath the ocean that allowed them to manifest their innermost fears. 
So it follows that the Lost Writers' Room might have tried to riff on this idea just a little bit, because they coined the term Crichton Island in the early development stages of the show. In other words, they used the works of the author as an inspiration for some of their sci-fi concepts. Sure, the show developed far beyond these initial influences, but the magic box feels very much like a tip of the hat to where much of this mythology originated. The end of this episode sees a deeply perturbed John Locke come face to face with his estranged father, Anthony Cooper. Ben teases the idea that Locke brought him to the island, simply by willing him to be there, even if it was subconsciously so. It seems like the magic box might very well be a real thing, or so we are briefly led to believe. But Ben and Locke have this other exchange later on in Season 3 episode, The Brig. Oh, 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 the magic box. Okay, Ben, how about you show me the magic box is a metaphor, John. I can't show you anything until you can show me that you're ready and willing to be one of us. So, what is the magic box? Is it real, or is it metaphor? Or is it both? Or is it something else altogether? We have to first consider the power dynamics in the scene in which Ben first brings up this tantalising mystery. A mystery that might explain all the weird stuff Locke has encountered during his time on the island. Ben is threatened by Locke's specialness, especially his undeniable communion with the island. Locke can walk again because the island healed him, yet Ben is in a wheelchair because the island did not pay him the same courtesy, and Ben's people can see that. Their own leader has, in effect, been rejected. This is why Ben does not get his cancer treated on the mainland. Having a tumour on his spine is a sign to the others that the island no longer wants him to be their leader. After all, people are supposed to get better on the island, and they're not supposed to get sick. The only time someone will get struck down by some kind of illness is if the island wills it to be so. There is always a reason for it. Think about Jack's appendix rupture in Season 4 episode, Something Nice Back Home. At first glance, it seems as if Jack is being punished by the island in some way, because he's trying to get his people off of it and it is speculated that the appendix rupture is intended to act as a sign from on high that he is not supposed to leave. Why did he get sick? Why? It's just, it's just bad luck. The day before we were all supposed to be rescued, the person that we count on the most suddenly comes down with a life-threatening condition, and you're chalking it up to bad luck? Well, what are you saying? That, that Jack did something to offend the gods? When people get sick, Rose. Not here. However, we know, due to all the predestined time travel events, that Jack is absolutely supposed to leave the island, and soon. The point of the appendix rupture is so that he has an emergency surgery, a surgery which sees his appendix removed, and this is the only reason that Jack survives long enough after the fatal stab wound by the man in black on the cliffs in the series finale. It buys him just enough time to return to the cave and recork the source. Had he not had this surgery, then the man in black's knife wound would have caused him to bleed out faster, and he might not have made it back to the cave in time. It's just like John Locke's missing kidney. It was a predestined event needed in order to give the character a fighting chance of survival at a key point in time later on. Everything happens for a reason, even if you don't fully understand that reason until years later, if ever. So, when people get sick or suffer grave injuries on the island, it's always towards a greater purpose. And much like Locke, the others have learned to read the signs in everything that happens, both good and bad. So, getting back to Ben. If he had travelled off island for surgery, it might have resolved his cancer battle, but it would have created several unresolvable issues for him back on the island. Think of it this way. Why would the leader of the others, aka the chosen people, need to be saved by anything other than the island itself. In fact, why hasn't it healed him? For that matter, why hasn't Jacob? The others believe that Ben has a one-to-one -one relationship with their deity, and yet their deity hasn't cured the cancer. There is no doubt that Ben would have also tried the Temple Spring waters as an alternative, but the cancer would have remained unhealed, and the others would start to question what exactly this all meant. And we already see that there is division being sowed within the ranks of the others. Not everyone is happy with how Ben has been leading the group. Not even Richard himself. They might be sensing that a change is coming. So Ben has to show his people that he is the right leader for the job, and that the island, and by extension Jacob, still wants him in power. 
Yes, he harbours this belief out of hubris and the need to cling to power, of course, because who is he if not king of the island? He doesn't want to end up like Charles Widmore in exile, but he also has some legitimate hope to validate and back up such beliefs. Because he reads the oceanic plane crash as a meaningful sign of a god in the machine. In season 3 episode The Cost of Living, he asks Jack, Do you believe in God, Jack? Do you? Two days after I found out I had a fatal tumor on my spine, a spinal surgeon fell out of the sky. And if that's not proof of God, I don't know what is. So if Ben can get Jack to perform the surgery successfully, then it might prove to his people that this was all part of the island's plan for him to get well and remain in power. Yes, it hasn't healed him directly as it does with other people, but he can still claim, look everybody, I got cancer on my spine and the island brought me a spinal surgeon direct to my door to take it out. I'm still special. But the truth he was struggling to come to terms with was that his time as leader was indeed at its end, and his cancer was part of the chain of causality that would lead to him pushing the frozen wheel. Being exiled. Killing John Locke and eventually returning to kill Jacob. The other major problem, something that is only just beginning to hit home for Ben, is that leaving the island for a controversial surgical intervention would leave a power vacuum that John Locke might end up filling in his absence. And this is a suspicion that proves to be well-founded, as it turns out. I have discussed in my videos on the pregnancy crisis and the real Henry Gale how Ben was overwhelmingly threatened by his people's reverence of John Locke which is why he tries consistently to undermine Locke's own faith and sense of specialness. He behaves like a jealous sibling. This is why Ben, when he's masquerading as Henry Gale, toys with Locke's ego and vulnerabilities in the hatch. It's why he makes the man question his faith in the button and the island. It's why he wants Locke kept far away from his people, and preferably dead in a ditch somewhere. By understanding the character's motivations and emotional interior, the magic box suddenly makes more sense. It becomes a way to mislead Locke. It's a way of saying to him, I have secret knowledge of the island, and you don't. I understand this place, and you don't. I'm special in a way that you are not, and never will be. Ben implies that Anthony Cooper somehow magically appeared on the island via the magic box, that somehow Locke brought him there subconsciously. However, the reality of what happened soon becomes clear once Cooper explains his experience to Sawyer in the brig. I'm driving down I-10 through Tallahassee when bam, somebody slams in the back of my car. I go right into the divider at 70 miles an hour. The next thing I know, the paramedics are strapping me to a gurney, stuffing me in the back of an ambulance, and one of them actually smiles at me as he pops the IV in my arm. And then, nothing. Just black. And the next thing I know, I wake up in a dark room, tied up, gag in my mouth, and when the door opens, I'm looking up at the same man I threw out a window. John Locke. My dead son. In other words, Anthony Cooper was extracted from the mainland on Ben's orders. He was ran off the road and whisked away by a clandestine team of others. This team was no doubt part of the same group that left the island on the submarine with Tom Friendly. And whilst Tom was recruiting Michael Dawson in New York for the Kahana freighter operation, another team was down south in Tallahassee, Florida, kidnapping Anthony Cooper. It is highly likely that Tom escorted and incapacitated Cooper back on the submarine to the barracks. This turns out to be the final voyage of the Dharma sub before Locke blows it up less than 24 hours later. We know Ben wanted the sub to be destroyed because it allowed him to renege on his deal with Jack and Juliet, without being seen as doing so. And this is not the first time that Ben has opportunistically manipulated unfolding events to claw back some control. As mentioned, Ben was aware that his time in power was at a critical juncture, that his grip on power was fragile. Juliet was looking to lead a coup d'etat against him, this was no doubt instigated as a direct result of his indirect murder of her lover Goodwin, keeping the man undercover with the paranoid tail section far longer than he ever needed to be. 
He is also aware that the hatch detonation has briefly revealed the location of the island, and he learns that Charles Widmore is putting together the Kahana mission to find it. He is besieged on all sides, both on and off the island, so he decides to shorten the leash on the others. This is why he capitalises on the Swan's failsafe detonation. He uses it as an excuse to jam all communications to and from the island via the Looking Glass. This was almost certainly in anticipation of Widmore's arrival, but it was also a cover story that he fed to his people to keep them contained on the island. You can't fight a war if you have dissenting factions within your own army, some of whom are looking for a regime change or to just get off the island altogether. So now with the submarine destroyed and communications jammed, he could maintain his slippery grasp on the leadership. And with all this chaos and uncertainty going on, it would not be a good time to install a new leader. The magic box was simply one more deception that Ben deployed to keep Locke in his place and in the dark, just as he was keeping his people in their place in the dark. But what does this mean for the origin of the magic box as metaphor itself? You might ask why would Ben even bring up such a concept if it were not a real tangible thing? And does this metaphor apply to anything else we ever actually see on the island? Well, Ben was operating within the show with a knowledge based on myth, half-truths, archaic traditions and rituals, and his own beliefs, which is why he misunderstood the true nature of the smoke monster. Sometimes he was following what he had been told by Richard, who was acting as a proxy to Jacob, such as taking Walt from the raft or building a runway on Hydra Island. Ben indicates that sometimes he would even receive instructions through dreams, just like John Locke does. I used to have dreams. And other times he was basing his long-held notions on what Dharma had established through their research. Let's not forget that he was a Dharma member for almost 20 years and freely moved between stations as a workman, and would have gained unrestricted access to all of their research after the purge. The rest of his ideas were directly influenced by the practices and beliefs of the others, who had been around long before he ever came to the island. So yeah, his magic box metaphor was mostly designed to make Locke feel less informed and in control, and to use what little knowledge Ben had of the island and its secrets to undermine the resident man of faith. And ultimately we find out Ben knew very little about how the island really worked or what his own role was in the grand scheme of things. He hated the fact that Locke had such an intuitive connection to the island, and that the island spoke to him in ways it never had to him, or at least not for a long time. I think Ben's metaphor was really the only way he could describe his own limited understanding of a place that showed him impossible sights. Emily Linus, his dead mother's ghost, walking the jungles of the island. Richard Alpert, an ageless man who had been around longer than any other human being on Earth an entity that resembled smoke and roamed the jungle killing anyone it judged to be unworthy of being there, an even more mysterious island deity capable of healing the sick and issuing specific commands from up on high like God himself. Indeed, the magic box was his only way of making sense out of this crazy place and its powers. It's what a person does when trying to understand the unknowable. We create our own metaphors, our own myths. And this leads me perfectly to what the magic box represents thematically within the show. In its purest interpretation, the magic box represents the nature of the island's power to show you who you are. It can reflect the struggles and regrets from your own past, or it can amplify your feelings about who you are today. More importantly, it can offer you redemption, the opportunity to follow a grander destiny that not only gives you a second chance to make the right choices this time, but to also give meaning to all of the wrong ones you made before you got there. All of your suffering, and all of those struggles, now have purpose. John Locke comes to understand this when he and Sawyer have the following exchange in Season 5 episode, The Little Prince. Why'd you turn us around then? Do you want to go back there? Why would I want to do that? So you can tell yourself to do things different. Save yourself a world of pain. No. I needed that name. Get to where I am now. 
on a metatextual level, to us, the audience, the magic box was a wink towards J.J. Abrams' now infamous TED Talk. In terms of the content of it, you look at, at stories, you think, well, what are stories but mystery boxes? There's a fundamental question. In TV, the first act is called the teaser. It's literally the teaser. It's the big question. So you're drawn into it. Then, of course, there's another question, and it goes on and on and on. Every question I answer will simply lead to another question. Firstly, this style of mystery box storytelling has its downsides, and its critics. As an author, if you're going to introduce a mystery box concept to your audience, you need to know what is inside that box. Because if you don't know, then you're ultimately selling the audience on an empty promise. I will be exploring this in more detail in a follow-up video that chronicles how the show was written. Perhaps the writers were also tipping their hat towards the online community that had sprung up around the show between season 1 and 2. A community that would speculate and theorise on everything from the nature of the black smoke, to translating hieroglyphic symbols on the hatch timer. Solving and working out the mysteries of Lost had become its own phenomenon, just as social media was emerging as a new way to interact with other people on a large scale. We were creating and imagining our own meanings and answers to what we were seeing on screen. Even now, years later, here I am still doing the very same thing that I started doing way back after season 1 concluded. Obviously, we have way more information now and a much better context to understand the answers, but enough ambiguity was left within the show for us to continue talking about it. So why does this matter when it comes to exploring the meaning of the magic box, you might ask? Because the show is also about perception, and how our characters see the island, and how they see themselves, in the context of both their past sins and their present day conflicts. It's why the show begins with an eye opening, then ends with an eye closing, and why so many episodes used an eye opening as a recurring visual motif. Because we are seeing things from the point of view of a particular character, which means their perception of what was happening on the island might be very different to the perspectives of other characters. And so it goes for us as individual viewers. Sometimes a horse is just a horse, but it's what our characters make of that horse that becomes important. Just like how Mr Echo and John Locke both looked into the eye of the smoke monster, yet saw totally different things. I saw it once, you know. And what did you see? I saw a very bright light. <laughs> It was beautiful. That is not what I saw. When Kate looks at this black horse, she sees the horse that ran in front of Edward Mars's car and inadvertently helped her to escape police custody. That moment set Kate's life on a whole new trajectory. And this is how certain fans will see it too, that somehow this is the very same horse, that the island has manifested it to communicate with Kate at a time when she needs it the most, no matter how impossible or unlikely that might be. On the other hand, a more suspicious viewer might look at this seemingly mysterious black horse and see something more sinister. They might see the smoke monster, they might see manipulation. Maybe it is the man in black observing one of the candidates. Then again, perhaps this horse is nothing more than a black horse that just so happens to look like the one Kate remembers. It's a reminder of her past that triggers certain emotions and actions within her that will lead to other future actions. We know there are horses on the island and that they have been there for some time. We also see that Mikhail Bakunin keeps a small ranch of animals at the flame station too. This black horse may have simply escaped its stable and now lives wild. There is always a strong element of fate in play in Lost. The island is influencing character decisions to lead them to certain outcomes, and sometimes this happens through supernatural means, like with the instructive dreams and miraculous coincidences, while other times it's simply presenting certain things to characters in order to lead them to the next link in the chain of events. But the idea that this black horse really is the same horse remains in the eye of the beholder, you can view it in one of several ways, and the story empowers you to decide for yourself. Some questions cannot ever be answered to any level of certainty, while other questions don't need to be answered at all. Does it matter to the story whether or not we know definitively where this horse really came from? 
or does it make the story more enriching for us to decide for ourselves? In Season 1 episode Outlaws, Sawyer is chasing after a troublesome boar in the jungle. He starts to project his own guilt and anger about his past onto it, sensing that the boar has a personal beef with him in some kind of weird way. Locke suggests a notion, based on a belief that his adoptive mother held, that some animals can be reincarnations of dead souls, that these animals come to us to essentially act as proxies for our grief, our rage, our suffering, and our guilt. Are they haunting us in some way, or are they trying to tell us that it's okay to let go, to forgive ourselves? It's implied that part of Sawyer starts to worry that this boar might actually be the spirit animal of Frank Duckett, returned to wreak a post-death revenge on him. But is it really Frank Duckett's spirit, or is it Sawyer's own guilt manifest and projected? Eventually, Sawyer declares, It's just a boar. There's another way of looking at it. Perhaps this boar signifies something more nefarious. Maybe it's a manifestation of the smoke monster. We know that the man in black can turn into animals and insects, and I believe he does so in order to get closer to the people he is trying to coerce, ensnare and destroy. To hide in plain sight and study them, without them ever knowing he was there. So could the boar be trying to lure Sawyer into the jungle in an attempt to bring out the darkness within him? It's certainly a valid interpretation of events in this episode. Later, in Season 2, Episode 1 of them, a tree frog starts to drive Sawyer crazy. It's as if only he can hear it. On the one hand, it seems to be a manifestation of his troubled conscience, which is why it only really bothers him and no one else. And he uses Hurley, the purest soul of the group, to help him track it down and rectify the problem. To help his conscience rest. But when finally confronted with it, Sawyer crushes the frog in his hand. It's a very symbolic gesture. He's trying to kill his own conscience. Or maybe, just maybe, the man in black is up to his tricks and mind games again. Sawyer is already on the edge and all he needs is a little push. I'm sure the man in black would be delighted to see the group fighting over guns and fighting one another. Again, it's open to interpretation. There are aspects of the show that can and should and were intended to be ambiguous. That isn't to say that there are no definitive explanations for a majority of what we see, but some of the mysteries do not need to have a one-size-fits-all explanation in order to be meaningful. I think the only thing that truly comes close to being somewhat of a literal expression of a magic box is the flash sideways, because the rules of reality, time, and the living plane no longer apply. It's a place where whatever you imagined or whatever you wanted to be inside of it will be there, the child you never had. The friend that you weren't going to leave behind again. A second chance at happiness with the person you let down. The life path that would have made you into a better man. The old love that you were finally able to let go of in order to embrace the next. The worst choice you ever made that you got to make over again and get right this time. The forgiveness that you needed from the people you hurt the most. The love that you once lost, then found again. The favour you got to return to the mentor who once believed in you. And the faith you had that was finally rewarded. Indeed, the Flash Sideways works as a literal version of the magic box for each person within it. In a narrative sense, the magic box means so much more than just another one of Ben's lies. It is the showrunner's way of communicating to us, their audience, that some of this story is about what our own imaginations bring to it. The show itself is a magic box too, because for six seasons we brought our own perceptions and interpretations to the narrative. We crafted our theories about what was happening and imagined our own versions of the island backstory that we didn't get to see, whether they proved to be accurate or not. We filled in the blanks and created new meanings, whether originally intended or not. In Season 1, the hatch was the magic box, and our theories had no limits as to what might lie within. 
Every new season presented us with new magic boxes that gave us a chance to theorise about and participate in the show itself, like no television show had ever really done before it, and like nothing has ever been able to replicate since. Many of the boxes were opened, and we got to see what was inside. Some of us loved what we found, while others found only disappointment. That's the thing with magic boxes. Once you open them up, the mystery is over, and the magic is gone. Which is why we should embrace Lost, for all of its perceived flaws and foibles. Because it still gives us something to talk about years later. The box never needs to be closed, as long as we keep talking about what we found inside, how it made us feel, what it made us think about, and some of the mysteries that still reside inside there somewhere. And now that we have opened the magic box and found that some of it is down to perception and interpretation, it's time to discuss some of the pervasive misconceptions about Lost that have caused debates and arguments within the fan base and among detractors for well over a decade now. The best place to start is with the most controversial question of all. Were they dead the whole time? They found the plane. There were no survivors. They were all dead. What? Lost is a complex show, with lots of mysteries and lingering ambiguities. Many viewers expected the series finale to bring all of these unknowns into full clarity. Like watching a movie with a game-changing twist at the end, in which the twist explains and then recontextualizes the whole story that came before. But Lost is not a two-hour movie, with several main mysteries that can be explained in one revelatory twist at the end, like say something like The Sixth Sense. This was 120 episodes of television, each episode clocking in at approximately 40 minutes, told across six years, aired on network television in a serialised format in which the writers had to battle deadlines, fan reactions, budget limitations, production problems, talent conflicts, contract disputes, and time constraints. So it requires a lot more discussion and analysis to explain something this big and complex due to its format and evolution over time. It can't all be summed up in one 10 minute video like the Sixth Sense ending explained. One video is not enough, as there are simply too many elements, ideas and themes in the show to do it that way. I mean, this channel is living proof of that. The question that stands before us right now is, were they dead the whole time? The short answer is a resounding no. They were not dead the whole time. This is not only a misconception, but a pervasive criticism that the show is repeatedly hit with. First, let's revisit the scene in the church from the end, where Christian explains to Jack, and us the audience, what exactly is happening. Yeah, I'm real. You're real. Everything that's ever happened to you is real. All those people in the church, they're all real too. They're all... And they're all dead. Everyone dies sometime, kiddo. Some of them before you, some long after you. This is a very clear series of statements. Everything that happened in the show, both on and off the island, was absolutely real. The lives of our characters before the crash really happened. And all of the crazy events that happened on the island after the crash really happened too. If they had all died in the crash, Christian would have no need to specify that some of the people in the church died long after Jack did, because according to the logic of this dead the whole time theory, everyone on Oceanic 815 would have been killed on impact. No one from that flight would have died long after Jack. The point of the sideways is that it's the place where our main characters come to remember their lives on the island together. They need to do this before moving on to the next phase of their existence. I think it's actually important to understand how such a misconception became so widespread in popular culture. The initial wave of people who thought that the ending of Lost indicated that the characters had been dead the whole time came from two camps after the finale aired. The first group were fans who were genuinely confused by the last scenes of the show, and could not fully reconcile the Flash sideways with the living world timeline. 
Some of these viewers simply concluded that because everyone was dead in the church and the sideways appeared to be an extension of their lives on the island, then they must have been dead all along. This misconception was compounded by the fact that the final credit roll occurs over footage of the original beach site with the oceanic wreckage, in which there are no characters present. The beach is desolate and calm, as if no one had ever been there in the first place. This footage was intended to be a way for the audience to decompress after the incredibly emotional finale. It was a stylistic choice. Unfortunately, this well-meaning attempt to play out the series with some meditative B-roll production footage actually misled some already confused viewers into thinking this was some kind of final clue to the audience. There have been multiple instances of the showrunners correcting this for the record, they confirm that the footage at the end of the finale was intended to be a stylistic choice and not a clue or a hint to something else. Carlton Cuse said they thought it would be a good idea to have a buffer between the end of the show and before the commercials start. They didn't have a lot of extra footage lying around, but they did have footage of the plane wreckage on the beach, which was shot before the wreckage needed to be moved. And so the creative team thought that if they put those shots at the end of the show, it would allow a few moments for the audience to reflect on what has just happened. Only when some people saw the footage of the plane with no survivors, it exacerbated the problem. We have to look at it from the point of view of people who never went back to rewatch the series, or even went back to just rewatch the finale. This idea that they were dead the whole time would never again be properly challenged, unless you went to Reddit or YouTube, or a place where discussions about the show still took place. I believe it's an honest mistake to make. Not everyone is a hardcore fan of the show, and not every fan re-watches the show over and over again. Some viewers are more casual. They enjoyed the episodes week to week, but never delved into the mythology, or went into deep dives on the story. These viewers saw those final scenes in the church and took them as the big revelatory twist ending that many had hoped to see in the final minutes of the series. An answer that pulled the rug out from everything that came before, just like The Sixth Sense. And this became a catch-all explanation for all the weirdness that happened in the show. However, when we look at the end credits footage with this idea in mind that everyone was dead on impact, it hardly makes sense. Sure, the plane wreckage is there, but there are no bodies. No signs of carnage, no signs of fatalities. If the characters had died upon impact, then there would be bodies everywhere. Now there is a second group of series finale watchers who also came away with this misconception about the characters being dead from the start, and these are the viewers that lost interest in the show somewhere between season 2 and season 3. They had given up watching it full time. Perhaps they sensed that the series had started to spin its wheels. You might know people like this, or maybe you are one of those people who gave up on the show in the early days. Some of these departing viewers returned for the series finale under the mistaken assumption that it would be an information download, explaining everything through exposition, or to reveal that aforementioned grand plan twist. This of course did not happen. If anything, the information download had come several episodes prior with Across the Sea. Instead, viewers who had not been following the show closely over the last few seasons found themselves walking into an ending without full context. To the uninitiated, those final scenes appeared to show that the characters have been in a purgatory state all along, just as many cynics had suspected from the first episode. It was a validation that bailing on the show in season 2 or 3 was the right call, and this misunderstanding fed into an emerging counter-narrative that not only was everyone dead, but the finale was bad as a result of this. It was seen as a cop-out, and that it never explained anything properly. The answer was, all of the things that just happened didn't really mean anything. They kind of didn't happen. That was the, my takeaway from it. What do you mean they didn't happen? It was like, all of the things that happened, all of these things that were set up as, you know, you've got to stop the man in black because X, Y, and Z. Sure. Uh, it didn't matter. Right. Well, because it wasn't real. Yes, it was. Well, but not really. I mean, it was like, it was like a shared fantasy. I mean, it didn't seem like there was like, I mean, what? No. These misconceptions and finale myths have become sadly prevalent over the years. The purgatory theory completely undermines the point of the entire series, and the importance of what the island represented and why the characters needed it in order to better themselves as people. My video series has gone to great lengths to explain all the mysteries in the show on their own terms. The theory that everyone died in the plane crash, 
and that the island was a place in purgatory is quite frankly a lazy way to explain all the strange events that happen throughout the series, because this theory ultimately means you do not need to analyse the show in any greater detail or depth. You need not untangle the plot threads, nor study the machinations of the narrative any further, because they're all dead, and that's the end of the story, nothing more to think about. As the years have worn on, this myth has been debunked not just by fans, but by the showrunners themselves. They have given many interviews explaining how the characters were not dead from the beginning of the show. Here is one of the more definitive ones given by Damon Lindelof, in an interview with On The Verge. So at the end of the show, um, the last frame of the show, Matthew Fox closes his eyes, closes his eye, and dies. Yeah. That happened, like, in our context of happening. Like, that happened, that's all and real. So, and so then, from the moment that he closed his eye, um, all that other stuff that we did in the, in the sixth season of the show, the flash sideways, where nobody knows each other, and the plane never crashed, that is whatever your interpretation is, I'm not going to talk about what our intention is, but that's what you would define as not having happened oh. or happening, but everything that we ever showed you, anything that takes place on the island and lost, happened, you know, absolutely 100%. The plane crashed, those people survived, everything that you saw throughout those six seasons, like somehow- like the whole struggle between good and bad, that's like a really meaningful thing that actually occurred. Yes. That would have threatened the universe had yes. it not been- The Dharma Initiative is real, the island is real, all those Hurley right now, right now at this moment in time, Hurley and Ben, uh, and with, help some, with, with some help from Walt, are actually running things on the island, um, maintaining it. Part of the confusion on this subject also comes from the way Season 6 was set up. Season 5 ends on the idea that detonating Jughead could potentially change the past and alter the futures of our characters, that they would never crash on the island and instead land safely at LAX. But the show eventually confirms that whatever happened, happened, because the sideways turns out to not be an alternate timeline. Jughead was simply a red herring plot device to take us into Season 6. The writers wanted us to speculate and believe that changing the timeline was absolutely made possible, because they wanted to Trojan horse in the Flash sideways. And without the time travel narrative preceding this, it would have become all too obvious that the Flash sideways was some kind of purgatory. This led viewers down the garden path to believe what we were seeing play out in Season 6 was an alternate 2004, rather than the afterlife. So, the island as being purgatory is nothing more than a myth. Sometimes new viewers might fall into the same trap, and mistakenly believe that in order for all the characters on the show to have arrived in the afterlife simultaneously, they must have died at the same time, hence everyone dying in the plane crash. But such a notion doesn't really hold up under close scrutiny, because there is no now in the sideways. Remember, time only exists in the living world, whereas the sideways exists within a fourth dimension beyond our linear, three-dimensional perceptions of reality. This purgatory myth also fails to explain the existence of other characters who weren't on the plane, like Juliet Burke and Benjamin Linus, and Richard Alpert, who isn't even from the same era as the Oceanic survivors. These characters didn't get introduced to the Oceanic characters until after the crash, so why is Juliet stuck in this island purgatory? Why is Ben? And what about Jacob and the Man in Black and their whole story in Across the Sea? That whole episode wouldn't make any sense if the island was indeed purgatory. I mean, think about it, they hadn't even been born until they were on the island. In fact, why did any of our main characters go through purgatory on the island, only to then die again, and then wake up in another purgatory? It really makes no narrative sense once you start pulling on the threads of this theory. In fact, it all unravels in spectacular fashion. If they were all dead the whole time, then there would have been no need for the Flash Sideways as a concept at all, because surely that is what the island was supposed to be within the logic of this theory. This reading of the show completely negates the entire purpose of the Flash Sideways in Season 6. Perhaps this might have had some validity if the story had stayed on the island for the whole of the series, and if we only ever saw the outside world in the flashbacks, but the show makes a point to take us back to the real world for large chunks of both Season 4 and Season 5, with the Oceanic 6 plotline. The dead the whole time theory undermines everything our characters lived through, 
everything they struggled with and fought over, and ultimately everything they died for whilst living on the island. We can look back on the sideways and accept it as fantasy, as a great what-if scenario, and this enriches the character arcs and themes of the narrative overall. But to look back on all six seasons as being set in literal purgatory does nothing but erase the drama, the stakes, and the various meanings behind the character stories and mythology. It erases the point of the show. Lost has many themes and ideas at its core that it wants us to talk about, big metaphysical concepts and small precious emotions. It wants us to feel, but it also wants us to think. There are definitive meanings and readings to a text whether we always understand the text or not, whether we like the meanings or not. In the case of Lost, they were dead the whole time is definitively and objectively wrong. If you just superimpose your own reading onto a text, rather than try to understand what the text is trying to say, then you miss out on its intended meaning, its intended truth, a truth that helps to unlock all the other mysteries and ambiguities. It's really important to be able to understand the difference between the truth of the world around us and the truths we choose to believe, as well as the difference between the stories being told to us and the stories we tell ourselves. There is such a thing as objective meaning and objective truth in fiction. Lost isn't a Rorschach test in which any interpretation is valid. It's a puzzle to be solved, and it is assembled from specific pieces that must be put together in order to create the complete picture. That picture is not about dead people in the afterlife experiencing weird events until they realise they are dead. It's about people who were lost in their lives, who find each other, and ultimately a second chance to find love, redemption, forgiveness, and purpose. But all of this takes place in the living realm, and it's like Jack eventually comes to realise when he tells Desmond... Desmond, I tried that once. There are no shortcuts, no do-overs. What happened, happened. Trust me, I know. All of this matters. I'd like to draw a line under this subject with another direct quote from series co-creator and showrunner Damon Lindelof. While I always believe in trusting the tale and not the teller, sometimes with Lost and this particular subject, nothing can be more definitive than the teller himself telling us all in clear and simple terms. Within three or four episodes of the of the first season of the show, they were like, it's purgatory, right? They're all dead. And we kept saying, we swear to God, they are not all dead. This is really happening. In the final, I think that in the final scene uh, of the show uh, that precedes the church where basically Jack's father, Christian Shepherd, says some things to Jack, one of the things that Jack says is like, wait a minute, hold on, is this, is this real? Like, did any of this happen? Right. Like, um, uh, his father says, it's all real. It all happened. Everything happened. Um, you know, and so I was like, that's going to make it pretty clear. Well, if it wasn't clear before, I hope it is now. One thing that isn't as clear is what happened to the surviving characters after they left the island in the series finale. This is easily the most open-ended mystery of all, but I would like to offer up some possibilities and to later discuss my feelings on the long-rumoured sequel series or soft reboot, and how the story might continue if this were to ever be seriously considered by ABC. So, let's talk about what happened after the end. And do you know what happened next? There has always been so much discussion about what happened within the actual show that we seldom ever get the chance to hypothesise about what happened after the main storyline concluded. Between Jack's death on the island and everyone waking up in the Flash sideways simultaneously, a lot of events must have transpired in the living world following the return of Ajira Flight 316 and Hurley's reign on the island. We get a sense of what might have happened afterwards thanks to series epilogue The New Man in Charge, but there are so many more blanks to fill in. Most of the ideas I present to you here are going to be based almost entirely upon the implications of the finale, but also what I feel is the logical progression of both the characters and the themes of the series as a whole. The showrunners intentionally left this area of the show open for fans to speculate on for us to create our own part of the story. 
you might imagine entirely different scenarios to the possibilities I'm about to put forward, and I'd be curious to hear about everyone's own personal takes on this, so please leave your own ideas in the comments after finishing this video as I'd really love to hear them. Let's start with the most clearly defined events post Jack's sacrifice and death. Hurley's reign as Island Protector. It's clear from how we leave him and Benjamin Linus in the end that a new era of peace is about to be ushered in on the island. For one thing, there is no more Jacob and Man in Black warring over the fate of existence. Both island deities have been killed, and their 2000 year old game has finally come to an end. The immovable yoke, as described on the cork, has been broken. The dead can finally rest. It is stated outright that Hurley's first action as the New Island Guardian would be getting Desmond Hume home to his wife Penny and their son Charlie. This would likely be accomplished in a very ironic way, through Libby's generous gift of a boat to Desmond many years previously, the Elizabeth, a mode of transportation that the Man in Black intended to use for his own doomed escape plan. The boat was still anchored offshore and presumably in one piece, which means Desmond would finally be able to leave the island for good, on the very same boat that first brought him to its shores. Yet another example of how the tapestry of time has everything in its right place at the right moment. Desmond would definitely return home to his family, although his homecoming would be bittersweet, because while Desmond is alive and well, he also brings with him news of Charles Widmore's death. Now I think it's fairly certain that Penny never reconciled with her father before his death on the island, and likely has many unresolved feelings towards him. We can only assume that she got to resolve these issues with him in the sideways off screen. Desmond and Penny and their son Charlie go on to live their lives back on an island of a different kind, the United Kingdom. Most likely in Scotland, where they can live out their lives in peace, because the island is finally done with Desmond David Hume. Hurley's other immediate order of business would have been to bury the dead, which means all of the victims of the Island War of 2007 could be put to rest. I mean, just from a practical point of view, you don't want a mass of bodies decomposing and decaying on the beaches, at the temple, and on Hydra Island. This process of burial would also include his late friend and predecessor Jack Shepard. I like to imagine that Hurley would have buried Jack beside John Locke on the beach that they once called their home, so the two men of faith could be at rest together, side by side. Maybe Rose and Bernard would finally find it safe to rejoin the general island population too, or at least they would be more interactive with people now that the dangers and conflicts have been eradicated. It's nice to think that they would have attended Jack's funeral, in any case. With Ben's help, Hurley would go on to reconstitute the remaining others on the island. They weren't entirely wiped out in the war. For example, former flight attendant Cindy and the children, Emma and Zack, are among the surviving remnants. We have to ask the question, would those poor children finally be returned home to their parents? We'll get into the possibilities of that a bit later. At this point, most of the radicals from the others have been killed off. Long gone are murderous henchmen like Mikhail Bakunin and Danny Pickett. Also gone are the religious zealots such as Dogen and Lennon. Even the political disruptors like Juliet Burke, who wanted to fracture and overturn the leadership, have died. So the others are now nothing more than fellow survivors of the final island war, just like Hurley. And all of these survivors were turned to him, not just as the island's new deity, but as the active leader of the group. He even has an endorsement from Ben, the man who was in charge for many years beforehand. And this is the way it should be. No more intermediaries or secrets or abstract rules. Everything is out in the open now. We know that Hurley believes in speaking the truth, and he likes to share his power with the people around him. Thanks to the epilogue, the new man in charge, we also know that Hurley eventually leaves the island with Ben to roll up all of the remaining threads that the others had dangling out in the world, including the Dharma warehouse that had been supplying the men in the hatch with resupply drops for decades. We don't find out what method of travel they used to go to and from the island, although it's possible that they retained ownership of the Elizabeth. There is also more than enough money in the pot from Ben's activities as the other's leader to afford them a private plane, or even use the resources of Richard's front company, Mitalos Bioscience. 
After all, they have a lovely stretch of landing strip on Hydra Island, and it would be a real shame to waste it. It seems the primary objective of this off-island visit in the epilogue is to recruit Walt Lloyd. In fact, this might be Hurley's very first recruitment, his own list of people that he would like to help him run the New Island Society. Only Hurley makes sure to give his new recruits the choice, and Walt chooses to come with them. In terms of the metaphysics, I think Hurley would gradually become aware of the source's will and form a deeper connection to it, just like Jacob before him. We saw that even after less than only a day in the role, Jack was already receiving strong protector intuition. And when we see Hurley in the back of that van, there is something different about him, a new confidence and wisdom. As for Walt, his return serves two purposes, as implied in the epilogue. The first is that Hurley and Ben know that Ghost Michael has fulfilled his destiny as a whisper, so now it's time to help Michael be released from his service to the island, and from his own guilt that keeps him there. But only Walt can help Hurley achieve this goal. So by bringing him back, the father and son can finally meet again and reconcile, and say all the things they never had a chance to say in life. With Walt older and wiser, he could articulate his emotions and find a way to forgive his father, and from that catharsis, Michael could finally move on into the sideways world. And this is why Ben tells Walt at Santa Rosa the following. We need you. You have work to do. Starting with helping your father. My father's dead. Doesn't mean you can't help him. Let's also not forget that another reunion awaits Walt too, one that was long, long overdue. I just wish we got to see it within the show. Would have been a real tearjerker. Now, I don't think that Hurley's quest would stop at freeing Michael. I believe that Hurley would have made it his mission to free all of the Whisper Ghosts trapped on the island, either through helping them personally resolve their unfinished business or bringing specific people to the island that might help the ghosts find their way into the sideways for rebirth. Much in the same way that we see him interact with Saeed in the sideways, he's helping Saeed to let go. Hurley was the most spiritually connected protector, with a clear connection to the realm of the dead, so this would be something that I feel he was destined to do, to help clear the island of lost souls, and free every last whisper to fulfil the dream of an island future that was long ago etched into the stone cork, so that the silence may reign, and we may sleep, to let the dead rest, once and for all. Meanwhile, he and Ben would help to train Walt up to someday take over the position of protector. Again, this was heavily alluded to in the epilogue, when Hurley says to him, You just need to get back to the island, that's all. It's where you belong, it's where you've always belonged. Why? Can I talk to you about a job? Judging from what we know about Hurley and how much he loves both his family and his friends, he doesn't want to rule as a guardian for centuries on end like Jacob did. Contrary to popular opinion, I don't actually see Hurley ruling for thousands or even hundreds of years. That's just not in keeping with his character at all. Remember, Ben specifically says to him in the end, But how? People can't leave the island. That's how Jacob ran things. Maybe there's another way. A better way. It makes sense that Hurley would do things completely differently to his predecessors. He might form a new tradition in which an island protector steps up every decade or so to take the reins, so that each retiring protector can still live a full life and grow old with the ones they love. These are the human considerations that Jacob's way of ruling never allowed him to have, which was a result of Jacob having no connections to the world. But we know Hurley does have those connections. They are a fundamental part of who he is as a character. Everything we saw happen during Jacob's tenure, including many of the rules, rituals and traditions, could now be reversed, changed and completely reordered. It is this channel's speculation that Hurley made the position of island ruler a temporary job going forward. Everything that we know about Hugo Reyes tells us that he has no interest in outliving all of the people he loves, whilst living on for centuries serving the island's will. The show demonstrated that the island is not a place you should spend your entire life, 
only a key piece of it. Granted, it will be the most important part of your life, but it's not somewhere a person should be from birth through to death. As demonstrated time and time again on the show, people who spent their entire lives within that snow globe did not leave happy existences, and almost all of them met tragic ends. Jacob and the Man in Black being the prime examples, but also let's not forget Alex Russo and Ethan Rom. While all of that death was for a greater purpose, the island was essentially the moth in the cocoon, struggling to emerge, and struggle is nature's way of strengthening it, which is why everything is different on the island after Jack's sacrifice in the series finale. That was the whole point of the writers ending the story there. The legacy of Jacob's reign, both the good and the bad, was well and truly over. A new era was beginning where people could have the chance to live normal lives again, free of conflict or coercion, where power could be wielded and shared responsibly, in which Jacob's dream of an island Eden, representing the best of humanity, could finally be realised. I imagine that by the time Walt is a 30-something man, he would be able to take over the position. That's what the island really needed, time enough for the current protector to train up a protégé. Mother tried this with the boy in black millennia ago, but because she was so twisted and influenced by her own darkness, she made things much worse. But someone like Hurley could provide a positive influence over the next protector, teaching them the things he has learned without subterfuge or manipulation. This channel maintains that Walt was the protector that the island needed and wanted next after Hugo Reyes. Someone special with psychic sensitivity, who spent time on the island as a child, but also has connections to the real world, and to their own humanity and morality. We can further assume that during Hurley's era in charge, he split his time between the island and his mainland home, so he could see his family. Or, alternatively, he simply brought his family to the island to live with him. If he could convince them to give up the mansion and the millions, that is. Either way, Hurley's guardianship will be about making things right with the island again, to put it back on an even keel and to create a community made up of both old and new islanders, an amalgamation. Even showrunners Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse like to jokingly imagine that Hurley runs an annual golf tournament called the Dharma Open. Because that's what Hurley does, right? He thinks about the well-being of others without imposing his own will on them. In my mind, it's almost certain that Ben stayed on as the number two on the island until he died, serving penance for all the wrong he did throughout his life. Perhaps Hurley helped Ben to communicate with some of his loved ones who had died on the island, such as Roger Linus and Alex Russo. Maybe even his mother, Emily Linus. This could be why we never see him encounter Emily in the sideways, because he had already worked through that loss. Or, perhaps, like Jack's father Christian, she won't appear to him there until he is ready to move on. We know that Ben had an uphill battle ahead of him in terms of redemption, and would need all the help and forgiveness he could get. This might be why we saw a nicer, more contrite Ben in the epilogue. He seems very humble and at ease, because there are no more games to be played, and no more enemies to conquer. He is no longer trying to control everything. Ben finally took on the role that he was best suited for, that of an intermediary, an advisor, a strategist, someone who could support a good leader. And let's face it, Ben had already learned how to be an advisor from the best intermediary he ever knew. And speaking of Richard Alpert, let's discuss what might have become of him. Well firstly, it might take him some time to get used to his newfound mortality, although he seemed rather delighted by the idea of it in the series finale. I sincerely doubt that he ever returned to the island again. I don't actually believe any of the characters on Ajira would ever go back. When the plane takes off in the end, it really feels like Richard's final liberation from his role. He is now free from his contract with Jacob, having fulfilled his duties across three centuries no less. So I see him as living out a normal life, in which he could grow old in peace, free of the burdens and responsibilities that came with the last 140 years of his life. I can picture Richard so clearly returning to his homeland in the Canary Islands to reconnect with his roots, maybe even visit the land where his old home once stood upon, and where he last saw his beloved Isabella. But what would a man like Richard do for the rest of his days in this long overdue retirement? 
Perhaps he would keep running Mytilos Bioscience and helping shield the island from the outside world whilst helping Hurley and Ben, but that means he is technically still working in service of the island, and I prefer to view him as being free of all of those commitments. He's given more than enough of his life in servitude. Let the man have some peace. As for the other characters that departed on the Ajira flight in the finale, this is where the most insane conjectures and theories will come into play. Because how in the world can Frank Lapidus and his skeleton manifest of surviving passengers possibly explain where they have been this whole time? How can he begin to explain why they are riding so light with many passengers missing? And more bizarrely, what would be the explanation as to how the flight picked up several people who were declared legally dead years ago, such as Claire Littleton and James Ford? In the immediate aftermath of the show, the discourse was surrounding the finale itself, not what happened after it. But to me, these are the juiciest questions to ask. Furthermore, what became of Kate? She broke the one stipulation of her probation following the charges being dropped and her trial being suspended. That stipulation was to remain in the state of California for 10 years. These are the pressing questions that we are left with when it comes to Ajira's return to the world. And in the immediate aftermath of the series finale, the discourse became about the Flash sideways and Jack's death and the meaning of the cork and all of these other fascinating parts of the mythology. But the most pressing questions within the narrative for the characters that we were left with when Jack's eye finally closed was what happens after Ajira escapes the snow globe of the island? Now, there are two wildly different possibilities for what happened to Ajira after the end of the show. Option 1. They go off grid. The group decide in mid-flight to land somewhere in secret. Frank would need to deactivate the plane transponder and black box in order to buy themselves some time to hash out a plan of action on what comes next, just like the Oceanic Six did when they got picked up by Penny. We don't know how much fuel was left in the tank when Ajira took off, so they wouldn't have too much time to search around for the ideal landing spot. But that isn't to say Frank couldn't find a stretch of land somewhere, isolated, to set the wheels down upon. With the exception of Miles and Richard, neither of whom have been declared legally dead or classed as missing back in the real world, everyone else would have to agree to spend the rest of their lives in hiding and never tell of their experiences to the world. Which means they need money and fake passports in order to start new lives. Richard Alpert might be able to assist them with this by using Mytilos money, Sawyer would know how to create and sustain fake identities. Kate would know how to run and where to hide. Frank could transport everyone to where they needed to go, maybe Mexico or Panama, somewhere where they have a chance of staying incognito. Someone like Miles could easily reintegrate into his old life, because it's unlikely that anyone knew he was missing, which is kind of sad in its own way. But what's more is that he is now in possession of diamonds that are worth millions. And you know what? Good for him. Someone got rich out of this whole ordeal, and Miles wanted it the most. Maybe he could use those diamonds to help out his friends. I'm sure Sawyer would get a couple of those diamonds for all those years they spent together working in the initiative. Frank could use his piloting skills to make his living flying tourists around in an exotic locale, much like how he was when we first met him. The irony being that after years of believing in conspiracy theories, Frank finally gets to live out his days as being a member of a legitimate, real-life conspiracy. Claire would need to find a way to reunite with her mother and Aaron. They would have to rendezvous somewhere in secret. She's obviously going to need a lot of time to readjust, not just to being back around people and being a mother again, but truly reckoning with what she had done whilst on the island. She murdered people in cold blood, and that's not something that you get over very easily. Another big complication for Claire would be trying to rebond with Aaron, and getting him to view her as his real mother. Kate would have imprinted on the boy by that point, so it would take quite a bit of work to get Aaron to understand who his real mother really is. I'm sure many of us would like to think that Kate stuck around to help Claire through this transition period, and to make it easier on Aaron, and that they became a sort of makeshift nuclear family. But an argument could also be made that Kate being present for this would only confuse Aaron further. 
it's a really complicated situation for everyone. So Claire and Aaron would probably need some space to reconnect away from Kate, at least for a while. The one thing we can all probably agree on is that, with Kate's help, Sawyer would seek out Cassidy in Los Angeles so that he could finally meet his daughter Clementine. I'm sure he would want to be part of the girl's life and have some kind of relationship with her. The fact that he told Kate on the chopper to seek his daughter out indicates that he has very strong feelings of regret about not being a father to her. Wherever Kate and Sawyer ended up geographically, I imagine they would remain close. Now this is a point of contention for many, especially any of the shippers out there who were either Team Sawyer or Team Jack, but some like to believe that a romance was rekindled between these two. And look, it is possible. They have romantic history and shared experiences, and they definitely have sexual chemistry, and now they have even more of a reason to stick together once they are back in the world. But it's also worth remembering that both of them would still be in the throes of grief. Jack and Juliet died but days ago, so they wouldn't be getting it on anytime soon. We also know that in the sideways, their romantic soulmates are not actually one another, but Jack and Juliet. They do maintain a flirtatiousness with one another, which is either an echo of the romance they once shared on the island, or it's indicative of something more that happened between them much later in life. I don't want to upset the jaters or the skaters, it's up to you if those two ever had any further entanglements as a romantic pairing. This version of the Ajira group's future is somewhat bittersweet because while they have returned home, it's not true home. They are in hiding, and they might even have to split up out of necessity or circumstance. They can never return to living a fully normal life again. I really like this scenario for various reasons, because while it has its own challenges for each character in terms of reintegration, it only requires us to tie off the threads based on the unresolved issues of their respective situations and character arcs. In other words, our imaginations don't have to do too much heavy lifting or theory crafting. Yet, many nagging questions remain about this scenario. Can Kate truly hide anymore? I mean, she is one of the most famous faces in the world as a member of the Oceanic Six, made even more famous by the fact that she once again disappeared on a missing airplane with other members of the Oceanic Six. Just imagine that, the media would be doing somersaults over the story. Perhaps Kate might not be recognised in a place like Mexico or somewhere more remote, but surely it would be incredibly unlikely that she could go the rest of her life without being noticed by someone, or caught on camera and exposed. Can the Ajira flight really avoid air traffic detection and land somewhere in total secret without being found out? Where would our surviving losties go in the short term? The first day? The first week? Would they all really agree to remain legally dead or missing and never again reintegrate with society as their true selves? I suppose Kate and Sawyer might be willing and able to do this since they both have a history of becoming other people, but would Claire Littleton? Would Frank Lapidus? And wasn't the whole point of Kate Austin's character arc that she was going to stop running? Does this hypothetical scenario undermine her journey as a character? Because surely if they wanted to stay hidden forever, they should have just stayed on the island, right? I mean, why would the writers have them leave in the first place if these characters are just going to spend the rest of their lives trying to hide from the world anyway? The inference we can make from Ajira taking off in the end is that none of them are going to return to this place now they have left it. The very notion that our remaining losties would all have to go into hiding and continue to lie and run away from both the truth and the world at large undermine the key themes of season 4 and 5 in regards to the consequences suffered by the Oceanic Six when it came to their lies and cover-ups. Imagining what becomes of the Ajira survivors is not just about factoring in plot plausibility, but also the show's overall themes. What would fulfil the character arcs in a more truthful way? Having said all that, this first option of what happened to the Ajira passengers is probably the cleanest, easiest answer, because it doesn't have to deal with the even more difficult questions raised by Ajira's re-emergence. So, let's explore this second, more complicated, and frankly more dramatic scenario of what might have happened after Ajira left the island. What if the survivors didn't try to run and hide from the world? What if they confronted everything head-on? What if they told the truth? 
Let's imagine Flight 316 escapes the snow globe around the island, and within a few hours of flight time across the ocean, it suddenly pops up on an air traffic control radar. Frank establishes communications with the nearest airport's control tower, and brings in the plane for an emergency landing. After all, he's good at those. For argument's sake, let's say they land in Guam, extremely behind schedule after having been missing for two weeks. Within an hour of the Ajira flight's reappearance, there would be hundreds of people in the loop, mostly airline officials, shortly followed by alerts to the media. Multiple embassies would need to involve themselves in this matter due to a number of missing international passengers from the flight. Our losties would be taken into custody and detained for questioning. Now there is no cover story they can use to explain away the many discrepancies of their situation if they land at an active airport. There is no cover-up that can be implemented to obfuscate the reality of where they have been and what they have been through. They must learn from the mistakes of the Oceanic Six and tell the truth. In this scenario, I picture the survivors being led by Kate and Sawyer, two characters who have learned to lead others over the course of the six seasons. They would lay out the events that led them to where they are now, with support from their pilot Frank Lapidus, respected CEO of Mitalos Bioscience Richard Alpert, and the airplane's flight data recorder. Together they would unfurl the series of events that had taken place. Okay, maybe they admit Jacob and the Man in Black from the tale, and leave out the more fantastical details of the collective narrative. It's impossible to say for sure how they might tackle questions, or how much of the story they would explain. Whichever version of events they tell to officials, their story will be lent extra veracity thanks to the presence of Sawyer and Claire, both of whom had been declared legally dead some years ago in the fake plane wreckage orchestrated by Charles Widmore. And it's worth keeping in mind if Hurley returned Cindy, Zack and Emma home with Desmond on the sailboat. In that case there would no doubt be more proof to back up these claims, that there is an island in which they had all been living on where a war between two tribal forces already living on it had taken place and killed many people, and that the Oceanic Six had gone back to rescue the people they left behind, only to suffer more casualties. This would expose all of the lies and cover-ups surrounding the Oceanic Six, although how much of this would be disseminated to the press and the public is open to further speculation. Maybe only some of the details of the Ajira story get out, there is no indication during Ben's visit to the mainland in the epilogue that the impact from Ajira's re-emergence has created such shockwaves. We know the events of the epilogue are occurring in 2010, thanks to the automated printout in the warehouse, which means the Ajira group have been home for at least three years at this point. We have to really consider what the consequences would be from telling the truth in this scenario. Our Ajira group would be in custody and questioned for days, possibly even weeks, about the whole affair. Would their story simply not be believable enough to the general authorities involved, or would their tales of the island suddenly revive a new race to find it amongst the various governments in the loop? How much do some of them know already? The US military has long since been aware of the island's existence, as has the Hanso Foundation and various other business interests. In my opinion, the truth of what happened would ultimately be obfuscated somehow, or even buried altogether before it could get out. It's easy to imagine these details being withheld from the public, and it creating gossip and rumours and myths about what really happened to Oceanic 815 and Ajira 316. Conspiracy theories on the internet abound. The fact of the matter is, even the most watered down version of the Oceanic and Ajira stories would be incredibly hard for most people to swallow. It's fascinating to consider this scenario for many reasons, but mainly because it throws up so many dramatic possibilities. We know that the living world continues long after Jack's death, which means other conflicts, adventures and storylines no doubt took place on and around the island. This is somewhat alluded to between Hurley and Ben in the Flash Sideways when they pay their respects to one another. You know, you were real good number two. You were a great number one, Hugo. They must have encountered new dilemmas and battles of their own, whether they were related to the Ajira group's reappearance in the world or not. It wouldn't matter how many people from the outside world knew about the island's existence at this point in the game anyway, 
because the only people who ever find the island are those that are allowed to find it by the protector, or are supposed to find it. And since the island is always moving, and Hurley is ruling over its shores as a peaceful guardian, world governments and the military-industrial complex are unlikely to ever be able to track it down. It could be argued that the reason why Ben is shutting everything down in the epilogue is in order to prevent anyone using Dharma technology to track the island now that the Ajira story is out. To those in the know, the only place capable of locating the island was the lamppost station in Los Angeles, which had been under Eloise Hawking's control. What the epilogue suggests to us is that Ben is actually shutting down all remaining Dharma operations, which means the lamppost would also be shut down and sealed off for good. Following the bureaucratic public relations nightmare of Ajira's return, and all the questions and investigations that would come with it, the passengers would no doubt stick together and present a united front on their story. Their return might prove controversial and confusing to the world at large, but they eventually would have to be released and allowed to return to their lives, because with the exception of Kate, having broken the terms of her probation, they actually haven't committed any crimes. In fact, most of them are survivors of pretty traumatic events. Would the district attorney's office want to pursue a prosecution of Kate Austin for a second time, only this time on the grounds of probation violation? Perhaps. It's conceivable that Kate would spend at least some time in jail for this. How many times can she slip through the net? I'm sure it would be taken into account that she risked her own life and freedom to bring back other survivors, and she would still be considered a hero by many. So, a long stint behind bars might be legally untenable. Whichever way her legal problems are resolved, I like to think that Kate would have informed the families of the Oceanic Six about the deaths of their loved ones. It would be a very emotionally fraught and painful series of visits, but I really can't imagine any other character doing this. Kate was connected to all of these people in very meaningful ways. News of his daughter's death, for a second time no less, would absolutely have impacted Mr. Paik. How could he not blame himself for how things ended for both Sun and Jin? When Sun returned home in the season 4 finale, you can see from the look on his face what her being alive truly meant to him. There is humanity there, so maybe we can draw a silver lining. Perhaps he would have raised his granddaughter with the love and compassion he never showed his daughter growing up. Gion was his second chance to be a better father figure and a better man. We can only but hope. And hey, if Benjamin Linus can make a dramatic turnaround, so too can Mr. Paik. However, I can't imagine Jack's mother ever getting over the second disappearance and actual death of her son. I feel bad for her the most out of everyone. Not only is her husband gone, but now so is her son. Again. And for real this time. It's just an impossibly tragic situation for her, and one that will no doubt weigh upon her for the rest of her life. If there is a small ray of light there, it would come from the fact that she gets to spend time with Jack again in the sideways, and maybe she moves on with Christian off-screen. And as in the first scenario, Claire would eventually reunite with Aaron and her mother, this time without the need to stay in hiding. As too would Sawyer, he would also reach out to his daughter Clementine to make amends for years of being absent from her life. His experiences on the island fundamentally changed him as a man, as did his three-year relationship with Juliet. If you're inclined to believe that Kate was indeed pregnant with Jack's child, as discussed in part 5, and that she gave birth to David Shepard eight months after returning home, then that is where her post-island story takes her. But look, I know that this theory remains somewhat divisive within the fanbase, and Damon Lindelof has indirectly debunked it, but it remains a comforting and bittersweet notion that some part of Jack continues on in the world, past his death and sacrifice. For more elaboration on this idea, see part 5 and its excavation of the sideways and David Shepard's meaning as a character. In both of these scenarios, the key commonality is that a lot of our characters would either be having or reconnecting with their own children. Claire, Sawyer, Desmond, even Michael and Walt, perpetuating one of the sub-themes of Lost about parenting and the consequences of getting it wrong. But it is with renewed hope that these surviving characters, having grown and learned on the island, will get the things right that their parents, and other parents in the show, got wrong. 
and their offspring might just become the next generation of island travellers in adulthood. Which brings me to perhaps the most burning question of all. Should Lost get a sequel? As far as I'm concerned, Lost closed the book on the island. A sequel or soft reboot isn't necessary at all, and considering how many of these legacy sequels turn out these days, the chances are that whoever reboots the mythology would only serve to divide or alienate the original fanbase in service of courting a new one. It would be nice to have at least one story that we love that doesn't get deconstructed, remade, or retold. However, I'm also realistic about this. There is a distinct possibility that ABC might one day make a spin-off to the show. In this age of the intellectual property boom, in which every single famous or semi-famous story or franchise is getting rebooted, it's unrealistic to hope that they will never touch Lost again. It's among the most successful shows of all time, so I think it will inevitably happen in some form eventually, but what form that would take is entirely speculative. They could just reset the story and keep the basic premise and some of the iconography and ideas. A plane crashes on a weird supernatural island, there's a smoke monster, and other people living on it. But the problem with that approach is that the built-in Lost fanbase would be turned off by the erasure of their beloved original. No one likes a full remake anymore, hence the emergence of The Requel. Another big problem is that Lost became quite a divisive show by its end, and generated a lot of negativity from both aggrieved fans and clickbait articles that still use it as a punching bag to milk content out of years after it ended. People who have never seen Lost often encounter this criticism first, and they mistake it for being the general consensus. But, as I explain in my Why You Should Watch Lost video, that is largely a myth. Regardless, this would mean ABC and Bad Robots would be up against that very same complicated legacy going in. Will new audiences be interested in investing in an IP that created such division within the original fandom? I think that is a turn-off for any network or company. And, from a practical writing standpoint, Lost had such a definitive ending, and such specific lore and mythology, as demonstrated on this channel, that it would be very tricky to do something new. Can they find a way to tell new stories within the construct of what already exists? We know the answer to a lot of the mysteries now, so how can they keep the mystery element fresh? These practical considerations are almost certainly why they haven't tried to do it thus far. It's just too much of a challenge. I have read and heard that some fans would prefer a prequel more than a sequel, something that peels back more layers of the island's mysterious past. I've seen it suggested that the Dharma Initiative could be explored further, but I personally never understood this one, we got more than enough Dharma in Season 5. I know people want to see what happened after the incident and the lead-up to the Purge, but we already know the broad strokes of all that, as I explore in my video on science and time travel, which documents the entire history of the initiative. Essentially, we'd be going over the same ground again. Plus, all of the actors familiar to us from that period in the story have aged past the point where they could reprise their parts. It's simply not a realistic option. Then there are those that call for the show to go back even further to a prior civilization. Now this is more intriguing to me, as you could tell a new story in this way without needing to retread over familiar ground, figuratively speaking of course, and there are several possibilities that come to mind. They could explore the first peoples to ever come to the island and settle there, and their experiences. Maybe the ancient Mesopotamians. But if they were to go down that route, I'd want to see the whole show cast kind of like how Apocalypto was, with complete unknowns who all speak an ancient dead language. And it would be entirely subtitled, as if we were watching a foreign language show. It would be totally different to what we have seen before, but we could have fun watching the origins of the lore. The first structures built, the first war, how the island protectorship began, and we could lead up to the birth of a character like Mother, I sincerely doubt that they would ever take such a risk like this, of course. An entirely subtitled prequel is something only us hardcore Lost fans would be keen to watch, but this is something I would genuinely find to be a cool spin-off idea. 
Otherwise, in a perfect world, I would love to see the dramatised version of the Egyptian period, with Jacob and the Man in Black fighting over the fate of the Egyptian settlers. Basically, the version of events that I set out in my video on the ancient past, but structured as a whole season of TV. But again, the problem is real actor ageing. Mark Pellegrino and Titus Welliver are supposed to be ageless within the story, but they've clearly aged in real life, so it would cost an absolute fortune to de-age them for the duration of 13 episodes or more. And again, would such a story appeal to new audiences? You'd have to bring all the context of the original series with you. I truly believe that the only way ABC could make a spin-off work is by going into the future, and it would have to be a continuation of the universe we know and love, rather than a full reset, but that would depend on several factors. Can they get a few of the original cast to return, such as Jorge Garcia, Malcolm David Kelly, or even Michael Emerson? I suggested a potential path for a spin-off before, both on here and on my Patreon. If ABC and Bad Robots were to hand me the keys to the kingdom right now and say, either you come up with the story or someone else will, I think my personal approach would be to start modestly, a 10 episode limited series would be the best place to launch a new set of stories from. Something self-contained and focused. Test the waters. In my version of this sequel, we would follow four main storylines. The first would centre around Gion. Her grandfather, Mr. Paik, has just died, and she is due to inherit his empire. Her whole motivation is to discover the truth of what happened to her parents, and why they left her and this quest leads her to finding out about the island and the survivors of Ajira 316. All of the survivors' whereabouts are currently unknown, but Gion uses her late grandfather's vast resources to track down the next best thing, and this would marry up to the second main storyline. Aaron is a grown man now, living in Australia, and he's become a bit of a Sawyer type, committing petty crimes and spending time in the local jail. He is estranged from his mother and no longer speaks to her, he eventually joins up with Gion in order to seek out his birthplace, and so they become our two leads. The third main story would follow the grandson of Alvar Hanzo, who is trying to find the island. It would turn out that the descendant of Alvar Hanzo has terminal cancer, and he needs to be healed, no matter what the cost, and he knows that the only place he can be healed is on the island. He wants to exploit the island's powers for his own gain going forward, he starts by taking over and reactivating the lamppost. Perhaps we could even wrangle a cameo from Eloise there. In this attempt to reclaim his birthright, he would become the main antagonist of the limited series. Gion and Aaron's story would see them globetrotting their way to the island, and overlapping with Hanzo's mission. Then the fourth main storyline would be based on the island itself, with Walt as the new protector, and through him we could finally explore and give closure to his story properly. We would be reintroduced to him, helping the Whisper Ghosts to move on into the light. However, the island is also going through a new evolutionary change. Something is happening to the heart that is causing life on the island to wither before its time. Trees dying, birds falling from the sky, animals getting sick, plants unable to grow. And this is having an effect on the outside world too, which would be a way of explaining how the island is the soul of the world and Walt is doing his best to keep everything alive, but he needs help. The island needs renewal of some kind. Eventually, he will seek out the help from former protector Hugo Reyes, who was happily retired in the normal world, and this is when all the stories would intersect. So that's my general pitch. If the limited series worked and was successful, they could do another and use its success to draw back a couple of bigger original cast members for the next season. Of course, we'd all like to see original characters such as Claire, Kate, and Sawyer return, but you can't do that right away. You have to build up to that and earn it, and create new storylines that would tempt those actors back, many of whom view Lost as being long done in their careers. But I think there is absolutely room for more stories. They just have to be told by good writers who understand the show and know how to build on it, rather than rehash what's already happened, or undermine the established mythology. 
I honestly believe you could get away with only bringing back Waltz from the original cast, and not needing to continue anyone else's storylines at all. Most of those characters actually got satisfactory wrap-ups anyway, and it would be a shame to step on the toes of how the original series ended. But that means, for this legacy sequel to work, Malcolm David Kelly would have to be involved, and I have no idea if he's interested in even acting anymore. So, a lot of factors would have to click just right for something like this to work, and while I prefer that Lost is left alone, I do believe there is room for a continuation of the mythology, something that will complement and expand upon the original series. As it currently stands, Lost feels like a complete work to me, and to definitively fill in these missing pieces would take away from our ability to imagine our own stories and theories. But what do you think? There are no right or wrong answers here. The writers left this part of the story wide open for us to co-author our own continuations of certain character arcs, and to imagine new stories. Please share your own theories and ideas in the comments. Maybe you have your own ideas of what happened after the end, or your own pitches and fan fictions for what a legacy sequel could and should look like. What's important to note with these post-script speculations is that they don't all have to be happy endings. Just because these people left the island doesn't mean everything will instantly work out for them going home. As discussed, there are many compromises and dilemmas awaiting them back in the real world. There don't have to be easy answers to difficult questions. We know what the story means to us as fans, even if we don't always agree on the hows and whys. And we know what the story meant to the characters, even if they didn't always understand their purpose in the grander scheme of the story. But what lessons can we take away from Lost as a narrative? What can we derive from its universal themes? And what do the character journeys and struggles reflect about our own lives? Well, we learn that life goes on. Our struggles continue in different forms. The fight between the light and the dark within ourselves never ends. Until it all ends. It only ends once. Anything that happens before that, just progress. Life itself is about struggle, and struggle is nature's way of strengthening us. We have to try and find the meaning in our own actions, by taking responsibility for the choices we make, and learning to let go of the past mistakes. The traumas that shaped us don't need to go on to define us. You can change. You can choose. We can be our best selves in the present and going into the future. And who knows, maybe you might find your soulmates along the way. Sometimes a friend can turn into a foe, and other times an enemy can become an ally. You will lose people you care about along the way, that is sadly inevitable. But with every passing day there comes new opportunities, and new love. Every other moment is another chance to do something differently. To make a different choice. To move forward instead of back. Left instead of right. You can't change the past, but you can own it, and learn from it. Lost taught us that moving on from the past is a long and involved process of letting go. But it also taught us that people who find themselves lost in their lives can always be found again whether it be through your work, your faith, your community, friendship, family, or the very act of love itself. We can find these things in our everyday world, but for the characters of Lost, they found them on the island. They found purpose. They found emotional catharsis and self-actualization. They found redemption. They found love. They found each other. And the lucky ones who live beyond the finale get to take that back to the world with them. And so they leave as better, more complete people than when they first arrived. And these characters live on not just in the outside world, but within the source too. Because time has no meaning there. It is eternal. And just like a great story, as long as we carry it within us, it will never truly die. Thank you for watching.